this is Brian Custer. I'm a senior consultant with 3, 3 Cloud, and uh, we we used to be Pragmatic Works, but now we're 3 Cloud. Um, and this presentation is on Delta Lake, which is um, a technology that was developed by the same developers of Apache Spark. Uh, it was just released in, well, the latter part of 2018, first part of 2019. Uh, so it's a relatively new technology, but it, it, it brings acid transactions and more to your data lake. So, and we'll, we'll go into this at a 100 to 200 level. Uh, I know that they're based on the poll questions that not everyone is familiar with Delta Lake. And uh, so we'll keep it, you know, low key and, and uh, try to uh, present it um, so that everyone can take something away from the presentation. Um, so Delta Lake, again, brings acid transactions. The big thing that it does is it brings acid transactions to data lakes, which is very important because uh, data lake can be uh, pretty challenging to work with. And um, they um, are challenging to work with typically because of the fact that there's lots of um, files out there that, you know, are semi-structured and uh, no structure at all. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, they're notoriously messy uh to work with and what i mean by that is is the files you know there's a lot of files out there that were have been partially read or partially written to and and maybe the job failed or, or something like that and so we end up with um, um bad bad rights to our data lake and and so what happens is is over time we get a lot of small files and directories and uh bad data due to failed rights uh during um you know, ETL, uh, essentially extract, transform, and load operations. Um, Del data lakes have been notoriously hard to work with, and Delta Lake comes in uh, really to the rescue. Uh, and what I mean by that is it, it essentially comes to the rescue from the standpoint of helping you to make sense of your data lake and uh, take uh, what used to be a, a really murky process, a, a, a very challenging process to work with data in a data lake to uh, a really a pretty simple process and one that, that is uh, very easy to, to, to use and, um, and, and it really helps you make sense of your data in a data lake. Uh, Delta Lake is, is definitely an open source uh, uh, storage layer um and um let me move this out of the way here so i can see what i'm doing um it's an open source storage layer and it brings acid transactions to apache spark big data workloads and i think we all know what acid transactions are but if we don't i'll go over that here and uh so that everyone is is uh familiar with what i mean by acid transactions the key features of delta lake include um acid transactions like i just said um scalable metadata handling unified batch and streaming which is a big deal um schema enforcement time travel data versioning and upsert and deletes on your data and finally it's 100 percent compatible with apache spark which makes sense because apache spark was is the developer uh, the people that developed Apache Spark also developed Delta Lake. So it is indeed 100% compatible with all of Apache Spark. And uh, you can work with Delta uh, just like uh, you would work uh, with, with any, uh, any other thing inside Apache Spark. Um, so what are ACID transactions? Well, ACID transactions, ACID essentially stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And so what atomicity refers to is an all or nothing kind of situation where we, we, either, we either write some data to a table or we don't. So in other words, if, if, if there's an error or something that occurs, uh, the, the data doesn't get written to the table. Um, if, uh, uh, you know, for some other reason we decide to roll back the transaction, we can and, and nothing gets written to the table. A consistency uh, guarantees committed transactions. And um, what that means is, is that it, it brings consistency to your data set so that you know that 
that um, the data is consistent. It hasn't been, uh, it, it's not partial rights or partial um, uh, transformations or anything like that. And, and we know that it's, that it's definitely consistent and, and reliable. Um, isolation, um, essentially well, all isolation means is, is that the transactions uh, that are occurring are, are essentially isolated. They're independent. And then, of course, durability means that the data is never lost. So any committed data that gets written is never lost, and um, you, you, you never lose the data uh, from then on. Um, with Delta, transactions are automatic. So I don't know, some of you may be familiar with relational database systems, and you, you might be familiar with uh, T-SQL syntax, where you have to go in and actually start a transaction, and then um, once you start a transaction, you have to physically commit the transaction. And that's, of course, if you're not using implicit transactions, um, where it, with implicit transactions, the transaction takes place implicitly, meaning there's nothing that the user has to do. Um, the transaction just, just happens. Um, so that's also possible with T-SQL and, and SQL Server or other database systems. Um, but with Delta, it's all automatic. So um, the transaction occurs without you really having to do anything about it. So you make a right to a, de a Delta table in Databricks, for, for example, and you don't have to say commit transaction or anything like that. I mean, it just, it, it automatically logs the right. And um, so you don't have to worry about uh, doing anything like that. Of course, the transaction log is the key as, is, as it is with any database server. And uh, Delta stores its transaction log with the file uh, in a special folder. And uh, everything that gets written to a Delta table goes into the transaction log. And uh, this then becomes the single source of truth. So your Delta data table that you've created and written to through various ETL operations or something like that becomes a single source of truth. What's uh, the, the other thing that, that Delta is really great at is handling metadata. And of course, metadata is just data about data, right? So um, with, with um, Delta, uh, this metadata is treated just like the regular data. And sometimes uh, with big data, you can have a big data problem just with the metadata of, of your data. So, um, and it uses the full power of Apache Spark to, um, to handle that metadata. So um, Delta is, is, is very good at, uh, right out of the box at handling metadata. Um, it, 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 again, it treats metadata just like data. It, you can display it using a statement called, uh, essentially that's, that's uh, described detail. And I, I'll show you that uh, in a demo that, that we're gonna do later. But anyway, it's just a statement and, and you can essentially see all the, the detail of your metadata about your data. Um, another thing that Delta is really good about, and, and something that's really taken the industry by, by storm, is streaming and batch unification. And what I mean by that is, is um, some of you may be familiar with the old Lambda architectures, uh, where you essentially have two architectures for, for bringing in your data. You have a batch system, and you have a streaming system. And so you're, you end up having to write code twice to do a batch uh, um, read or, or a batch write, as well as uh, doing a stream, streaming write. So you end up having to maintain two sets of code and, um, and, and everything. And Delta uh, takes that away, uh, takes that complexity away. You don't have uh, a, a situation where you have to have two sets of code to write to a, a Delta table from it's, it's an excellent streaming source and sync, as well as a batch source and sync. Um, it overcomes limitations of streaming and batch systems. And, and some of those limitations are, are what I just described, which is essentially having to um, create two different systems to read in batch data versus streaming data. Um, another thing that Delta is, is uh, known for is schema enforcement. So, with schema enforcement, um, schemas are enforced at write time. 
So in other words, when you go to write to a Delta table, um, if you try to write uh, data to that table that doesn't match the schema, you will essentially get an error. And uh, unless you have something called automatic schema update set uh, on your Delta table, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, with automatic schema update, uh, you, can, you can essentially let your schema drift. And, um, and all you have to do is use a statement called merge schema. It's actually an option on your Delta table. And uh, you can set that to true, and then you can have automatic schema drift. But uh, if you don't have that turned on, your schemas are enforced at write time. So in other words, you can't have any data that has um, different data types or you know, different columns or uh, different name columns, uh, anything like that. Um, it, it will actually throw an exception if you try to write that data to a Delta table. The enforcement methodology essentially is it checks for, um, it checks for your your data and it makes sure that all the columns match that the column names match the column data types match and um, it essentially uh, uh, looks at that before it tries to write any data and if if some of the columns don't match by name and by data type then um, the write will fail um, so um, let's go to uh, time travel so with time travel, Delta Lake is, is, is um, also known for time travel. And time travel, all that means is, is that due to the transaction log, we can go back to and, and create older versions of the data uh, of a Delta table very easily just by using either a schema num uh, uh, excuse me, a um, version number or a um, uh, version date, a timestamp. So we can go back either using a timestamp or a version number and look at past data in our Delta table and reason about that data and maybe, I don't know, roll back or audit the data or um, maybe you did a machine learning experiment on a particular version of the data and so you want to roll back to that version to repeat that experiment. There's lots of reasons to, to, to do time travel and to go back and look at other versions of your data. And Delta makes that very easy. Um, it, it's very easy to query and, and uh, get your history uh, of your data. Um, upsets and deletes. So with upsets and deletes, um, essentially you can go in and either update your table or delete your table, delete table rows or um, merge data. And um, so merges are like the SQL merge into statement, except that uh, there's additional support for delete and extra conditions and updates, inserts, and deletes. So um, what that means essentially is, is that it's very similar to a SQL merge statement. So uh, if you're familiar with SQL merges, um, you, you're, you're not gonna, it, it's gonna be pretty simple to, to do a merge statement with Delta Lake. Um, and the merge statements are, are actually even more powerful than SQL merges. Um, upserts are accomplished using merges. Um, updates and uh, deletes are accomplished with a predicate. So what you do is you just, you know, just like in SQL Server or, or a SQL based uh, relational database, you just go in and you say, I want to update these rows where a condition is met. And the same applies to delete. You, you say, I want to delete uh, a set of rows where a condition is met. And you can do that on your, on your data. Uh, and it's, it's really very powerful to be able to do that because before Delta Lake, working with the data lake and trying to, to go in and update some data or delete some data, um, it was a real chore and uh, very difficult to do. And uh, with Delta Lake, it's a breeze. Um, so let's go on and talk about Delta Lake architecture. Um, with Delta Lake architecture, um, essentially you um, have, uh, uh, hold on a second. I think I've, I, I've got, um, I'm missing some slides. Uh, bear with me here, hold on, with the demo here. And so I'm gonna take you to the community uh, site for Databricks, and um, basically, 
Um, what that is, is Databricks has created a community site where you can go in and do uh, essentially Databricks work on a community cluster. And um, the cluster is scaled down. Uh, it's not a, a, a real powerful cluster, but you can definitely go in for free and play around with the technology, get to know the technology, and you can do all this, all this for free. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually go into um, a demo and let me pull that demo up and I'll explain what we're gonna do. Um, so with the demo, we're gonna look at um, reading in some data from a sample table that our sample file on Databricks. And we're gonna read that data into um, a Delta table. And it's very simple to do. The very first thing that you want to do is um, uh, attach your notebook to a cluster. So I've got a cluster running right now. I started it before the presentation. And um, essentially, you just go in uh, to do that. I'll just go ahead and go over this real quick. What you do is you come into the cluster page and you create a new cluster. And um, essentially, with Databricks Community Edition, you don't get a lot of choices here. Um, you pretty much just get to name it. And uh, the instance has 15 gigabytes of memory. And uh, there's no workers. There's just the driver uh, in, the, in the Community Edition workspace. But anyway, it, it, uh, it's real simple to create a cluster. And once you create it, then you can come in here and create a, a notebook. And a notebook is just very similar to a Jupyter notebook and that some people may be familiar with. Um, and it's a great way to collaborate with your co-partners or your, you know, your colleagues uh, on doing ETL work, uh, doing machine learning uh, work, um, you know, whatever you're doing, you can collaborate using these notebooks. And so my first demo is um, I'm going to show you how to create and work with a Delta Lake table. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read in some data from the sample directory. Uh, on Databricks, there's always a sample directory called Databricks Dataset. And um, uh, in this case, I'm going to read from a folder called uh, Event under Structured Streaming. And I'm just going to read that in. I'm going to convert one of the columns that's a date column, uh, I'm sorry, that's a time column into a date, a Unix date time, and uh, with a format of YYYMMDD. So um, that's all I'm going to do in this cell. So the way to execute a cell, you can either go up here and click on the run button uh, on the right hand side, or you can just simply hit shift enter and the cluster will go ahead and execute your cell. And uh, basically what I'm gonna do is once I read in that data into a data frame, I'm gonna display it here on screen for you. So this cluster is working on the task right now. And then here's the data frame. I'm showing the first 1000 rows here. And essentially all it is, is it's just a, a, a data frame that has two columns, one with an action and another one with the date uh, of the action. So it's a very simple data set, and this is the data set that we're going to work with throughout this demo. So um, the first thing that you want to do when you when you want to write some data to a Delta Lake table is you you've got to essentially do that. Um, now there's several ways you can you can create a Delta table. Actually, there's two ways for sure, and that that is number one you can convert if your data is already in Parquet format you can essentially convert your data into a Delta table just simply running a convert statement. Uh, I won't get into that here, but you can do that. Uh, you, can, you can convert it uh, straight away into a Delta table if it's in Parquet format already. Delta Lake stores all its data as Parquet. So, uh, and Parquet is just a columnar data storage technology uh, that's open source and, um, it's, it, it essentially gives you the ability to um, uh, read your data in and um, uh, store it as a, a Parquet file uh, that's high performance and you can, it, it's very high performance on reads, high performance on writes, and uh, it's, it's, it's a great storage technology. Anyway, so now that I've got the data read into a data frame, 
I can go ahead and overwrite um, or, or excuse me, write that data to a delta table, simply running this statement here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use mode overwrite just in case there is a table already named event um, at this location, delta slash event. So I'm going to run that statement now. And um, essentially all that does is it's going to write the data to a delta table on disk and create uh, essentially all the storage for the delta table, including a transaction log. So now that we've got this delta table, we can start looking at it as a delta table moving forward, and um, and and it will have all the characteristics of a delta of a delta table, including the transaction log and uh, metadata and all of that. Um, so once you uh, read the delta table from disk, um, or excuse me, what we'll do next is we'll read the delta table from disk. And the way to do that is it's real simple. Uh, you just in Python, you just do spark.read.format delta and you load the table wherever it's been stored. And in this case, I've stored it in delta slash events. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll do shift enter and uh, we'll um, run, run the job. And um, essentially all these are spark jobs. So every time you, you execute a cell in a, in a notebook, you're actually running a Spark job in the background, and the Spark job does what you tell it to do. Um, and in this case, what I'm telling it to do is to read an events delta, uh, uh, essentially a, the events table, I'm getting it to read it into a delta table from, from disk. And so now I've got an events delta table that's read into from disk, and essentially I'm displaying it here. Um, well, it's, it's displayed as a um, chart right now, but let me show you the data first. Okay, so now it's, it's the data and you, you can see the action and the date columns, just like we saw before with the, with the standard data frame. Um, now we can go in and actually chart this data if we want. And uh, we can do that by putting uh, the date uh, and the action, uh, we want the action in the series grouping, and then we want to count the action in the values. And um, we want to store the date in the keys column. And let's see, what's going on here? Why are we not getting any data in our chart? Um, action, uh, we want to do a count. Okay, there we go. So let me um, click apply and confirm. And uh, then we'll go back and we'll look at this data um, as a chart. So now you can see it as a chart. And um, essentially, I'm just counting the close and open actions. And um, it looks like we've got an error running command four for some reason. Um, let's see what's on command four. Why are we getting an error? I don't know. Uh, it looks like we have a class exception. Um, looks like we're trying to convert something from long to um, a string. Um, I, I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, it, it doesn't matter because we've already read this data into events delta. So we have events delta setting, setting there uh, ready to go. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create a SQL table and or a high metascore table from a delta table so essentially we're just going to drop the table if it exists already and we're going to call it event and then we're going to create a table uh event using delta location so here we go let's go ahead and hit enter and see what happens so we're making the hive catalog command and we're doing the raw operation. So now we have a delta events table, and, uh, an events table that's based on a delta table in our database. And I'll show you that right here. Uh, you can see it right here. So this is the events table. And here's the schema for it. And here's some sample data. Um, and so uh, that's, you can always use this data uh, area to look at your Hive Metascore tables uh, in your uh, in your workspace. 
anyway, getting back to the to the work to the um, notebook, um, let's go ahead and pull that back up. Um, let's go down to where we were. So we visualized the data, and um, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, essentially count the number of rows. Uh, I'm out of sequence here is what's going on. I'm sorry for that. What happened was is I read the data into a, a new delta table, and then I created a SQL table from the delta table, and now I'm just going to count that. So let's do that. And you'll notice that I have 100,000 rows. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize that data uh, and aggregate it uh, just like I would do any other data frame. So the statement essentially is uh, we take the events delta table, that's a delta table, we do a group by action on it, and we're grouping by action and date. And then we do an aggregation, which is a count of action, and we alias that and call it action count. And then we order by date and action. So I'm going to go ahead and run that cell now. And uh, it, for some reason, whenever I run the cell, it, it knocks me down a few cells for some reason. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, but anyway, it's already uh, set as a chart. Um, and you can see here that uh, the, the, the counts are, are being shown here uh, by date. Um, and this is all from a delta table. Uh, so you can do, like I said, you can do just about any function, Spark function, on a delta table that you can on a regular data frame. So Spark and delta are joined at the hip, if you will. Um, you, can, you can do anything to a delta table that you can to a a, a standard data frame. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to read in some historical events. And what that means is, is we're going to essentially go in and uh, read some data from, from uh, disk again. And this time we're going to take the column, the time column, and express it as a date column using the from Unix time function and uh, create a, a new data frame called historical event. So let's go ahead and run that cell. And um, it'll run. And so now we've got a data frame called historical event. This is not a delta table, you see, because we didn't, we didn't use delta to load it. Uh, we're just bringing it in, we're inferring the schema, and uh, we're reading it as a JSON file. And so that's, that's all we're doing. And we're just reading it into a normal data frame. Um, so now let's go ahead and append this data to an existing delta table. So if you remember, we have a delta table out there called events. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna append the historical events we just read into, uh, into a data frame. We're gonna write that data frame to the delta table. And we're gonna partition it by date. So let's go ahead and run that cell. And um, there we go, uh, it's running now. So, uh, the one thing about this uh, community edition, I'll just say it right now, is um, it's, it's a little slow. And the reason is, is again, we don't have um, any worker nodes. All we have is a driver node. So that's why it's kind of running a little slow. Uh, normally these things would be running really fast if I had a, a standard cluster with like, you know, two or three nodes or four nodes, um, uh, it would be running a lot faster. But anyways, this will do well, uh, do very fine for us. Um, so anyway, now we're going to look at the aggregate of uh, the Delta table. So we're going to use an aggregation and again, it's the same aggregation that we ran uh, earlier. Um, and we're just grouping by action and date and doing an aggregation, uh, which is a count of action. And we're gonna alias that column as action count, and then we're gonna order it by date and action. So let's go ahead and hit the enter, uh, shift enter key here and uh, run the, the, the job. I'm gonna move this out of the way. Um, and let's see, I'm going to move this like that, get 
get this kind of out of the way. All right. Uh, so anyway, you can see the aggregations here plotted uh, with a real nice plot. Um, that's one of the nice things about using uh, Databricks notebooks is you you can do uh, you know pretty sophisticated plotting uh, very easily just by clicking the plot button here. And you see here you can use you can choose a whole bunch of different kinds of plots uh, here. And um, and and then um, you can just plot your data. So it's really nice for data exploration and and things like that when you're trying to explore your data and um, and see what your data is all about. Anyway, that's the aggregation. Uh, now we're going to count the number of rows again and see that um, we now have 200,000 rows because we essentially appended 100,000 rows to a delta table that already had 100,000 rows. So that gives us 200,000. And then we're gonna take a look at the delta table on disk. So that's real simple to do. All you need to do is use the dbutils um, functionality in Databricks to uh, essentially look at your file structure uh, for the events table. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'll hit shift enter. And uh, you'll notice here that we've got a whole bunch of files now, and they're all in Parquet format. And uh, you'll notice that they're all uh, named here, and, and then we have a part, uh, and you know, it, it, it's a serial part. So it goes from zero all the way down to, um, essentially, it, it names them you know, with, with part-001, part-002, and that sort of thing. That's just the way that it names each file. Um, and the file info is over here, and it, 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 it's essentially saying that we're partitioning this data by date. So um, anyway, uh, that's kind of how a delta table looks on disk. Um, and then to optimize the table, we can run an optimize statement. And um, that's a Spark SQL statement. So you notice I'm using Spark SQL method here, spark.sql, and I'm going to optimize the events table. So let's go ahead and do that. And um, why I'm doing this is, is I have a lot of files uh, out here, and um, it's going to slow my performance down if I, if I maintain that, if I keep that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to optimize it by essentially uh, removing a bunch of files and you can see here that I've removed 38 files and then I've added five files so what I've done is I've compressed the number of files down and and then um, uh, essentially uh, made it the the number of files I've cut the number of files down by a, by a considerable amount and so consequently that's going to increase the performance of that delta table so anyway, uh, that's what I've done there. Now, um, the last thing I'd like to show, or one of the last things I'd like to show you with this demo is how to look at the history uh, of your table and see what, what you've done to the table uh, over the course of the Delta table's lifetime. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this cell. And uh, then you can see here the history. And you'll notice that the version number is over here on the left-hand side, and I'm at version number five, and uh, the user is stored here, the operation is stored, and the operation parameters is stored, as well as a whole bunch of other columns, the job, the notebook, the cluster ID that did the work, the read version, the isolation level, um, a whole bunch of other data about uh, the operations that we did. Um, and so um, it's, it's really nice to be able to go back and look and see what you've done to your data uh, over time. Now, again, we didn't do a whole bunch of stuff here, but if I was doing a major ETL job, uh, you would see this table grow in size considerably, and you would see all the operations that, I, that I've done on that data and then if I wanted to, I could come in here and select a particular version and roll back to that version. And the way I would do that is I would essentially select for that version. So I would select for version five, let's say, 
and then I would uh, select that into a data frame and then append that data frame or overwrite our, my existing Delta table with that version of data. And so um, that's how I would roll back, so to speak, from a, a, maybe a mistake or something like that. So um, that, that's um, pretty much it for this. No, actually, I've got a few other things I want to show you here uh, before I let this demo go. Um, for show table details, essentially what you can do is you can show the, the details of the table. And what that does is it shows you the, the uh, metadata about the table. And uh, so I'll run this cell here. And um, you'll see here that the format is Delta, as we know. Uh, the name is default.event. So this is, the, uh, this is the database name of the file. And the location of the file is dbfs delta slash event. And it was created at this date and time, and it was last modified at this date and time. So um, you also have a lot of other uh, metadata here. You have partition columns, number of files, the size and bytes, the properties of the, of the table, min reader version and min writer version. So um, it's pretty neat. Um, you can really see a lot of information. I know this is kind of hard to see on this table because um, uh, the scroll bar was, was getting in the way. But um, you can see here that the partition column is date and the number of files that we have are five, which shrunk way down from uh, an original size of 38 files. And the size in bytes is 27,939. So pretty cool, um, really easy way to, to look at the detail and, and examine the metadata of your tables. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to show you one other thing, and that is um, how to get the format of the events table. And what this will show is, again, more metadata about the table. So um, I'll run this cell. And, um, and essentially, um, it shows you the column name, so it's action and date, as we saw before, and the data types are string, and the number of partitioning, there's one partition, and it's on the date uh, column, and there's some detailed table information here. Uh, the name is default.events, that's the name of the uh, Hive Metascore table, and then the file location of the events delta table is right here, and the provider is Delta, as we know. And then if I had a bunch of table properties, that would go here. I don't have any table properties, so that's why you're seeing an empty array. But anyway, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for this demo. Uh, I hope that you got something out of it. Um, what I was trying to show basically is, is that it's very easy to go from a standard data frame to a Delta table with just a few statements and you, then you can start working with Delta and using all of the features of Delta. So that was the main purpose of this demo. So let's go back to the slide deck and what I'm gonna do, and pardon me for this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and go back up to um, this slide here. And uh, uh, shoot, it's still not doing what I want it to do. Hold on just a second. Um, what I want to do is I want to show this slide. Um, I don't understand why it's not showing this current slide here. From current slide, um, shoot. Okay, well, I tell you what I'll do. I'll just, instead of presenting it, I'll just show you the slides here. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is Delta Lake architecture. And since I'm having trouble with my PowerPoint here, I'll just show you the slide uh, using the uh, design surface of PowerPoint. Um, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so with Delta Lake architecture, there is a standard architecture for Delta Lake. And it's essentially um, all about bronze, silver, and gold. And so what that means is, is that we typically ingest data into our data lake and we note that as a bronze table and the reason we do that is because at that point the data is really not useful for anything other than 
uh, subsequent ETL actions. Uh, in other words, we can't turn this data over to our data scientists or our uh, BI folks and expect them to be able to do anything with it because it's still in a pretty unnatured state. And so all we're doing at this point is we're just trying to ingest the data from the data lake into a known schema and and then we'll start doing our transformations and everything into silver and then um, into finally gold tables. So that's kind of the architecture, how the architecture of Delta Lake works. Uh, bronze Delta tables, um, essentially with bronze Delta tables, uh, again, it's just the raw ingestion of data. Um, you go in and analyze the um, data for problems uh, once you've read it in. And of course, remember now that what we're doing is we've attached a schema to the, to the um, data frame. And so we read this data in using a schema. And at that point, we can enforce the schema and make sure that the right happens without errors. And we know that we have a good schema at that point. So that's really what a bronze delta table is all about. It's just, hey, I've got a table here. It's got a schema attached to it. And we know that it matched the schema. So we're good to go for further ETL evaluations downstream. So anyway, um, with bronze, uh, again, we're, we're going to formulate a pipeline to clean the data and work on that um, uh, to, to um, essentially take that bronze table to a silver table and then finally to a gold table. Um, silver de delta tables are essentially incrementally clean ta delta tables that you know, have undergone some ETL. Um, we're we're going to go in and visualize this data typically and do some data exploration uh, to see what else is needed. Um, and we're going to look at it uh, holistically and, and see if there's other transformations that we need to do. Uh, maybe we need to join this table to another table or union this table to another table. Uh, you know, there, the sky's the limit really uh, with Delta. You can do just about anything you want with it. And uh, so with silver, we're just, you know, getting there. I mean, we're, we're on our way to gold, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and then finally, once we get to gold tables, um, these are the tables that we distribute to our end users. And our end users can be any, anyone from a data scientist to a BI person or an analyst uh, at this point. Because what we could do is once we create our gold tables, we can then uh, create Hive Metastore tables or database tables, and then BI folks can go in and actually analyze those tables just like they would uh, uh, any other kind of table using something like Power BI. Um, and gold, gold tables that essentially are the result of all your ETL actions that you've done. And of course, ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. And um, essentially, it represents all of those actions that you've done. Um, it's usually, a lot of times it can be pre-aggregated and uh, for, for certain purposes. And it represents pristine data that machine learning people and analysis analyst people and other people like that can look at the data and, um, and do what they need to do with it. Um, and you can also use it for other downstream processes. For instance, the project I'm working on right now, we're actually creating gold tables that will be part of an application. Um, so the gold tables will reside in a SQL Server database and actually become part of an application that the client uses to um, manage um, their clients' um, data. So anyway, um, that's pretty much it for, for the architecture. So now what I'd like to do is go into my last demo for the day, and um, I'll take you there real quick. Um, let's see, let's go to um, demo two. So the first thing I'm gonna have to do with this demo is I'm gonna have to run uh, essentially uh, some cells to make sure that I have a library installed that I need. So I'm going to make sure the cluster is, is attached. So I want to attach my cluster that's running. And I want to run this cell here. And all this cell is doing is it's just making sure that I have this library, which is a Python library. Uh, it's called PathLib2. 
I'm just wanting to make sure that that library has been installed uh, and that I can use it. Now I'm going to run some setup code and uh, I'm going to run this cell. And what this cell is going to do is it's going to set up uh, some of the stuff that I need for the demo. So that's all it's doing. So just bear with me while it runs and uh, we'll let it run and, um, and generate all the data that I need. Um, sometimes it takes a little while to run. Uh, it says it's all done, so we'll assume that it's finished. Um, usually I get a, um, I'm gonna run it one more time because usually I get a list of things that it's done. And uh, this time I didn't, so I'm gonna run it one more time just to make sure that it's done everything that I've asked it to do. Well, it's, it's finished and it didn't error out, so I guess I'll assume that it's been done. Uh, anyway, so here I'm going to set up some paths on the file system uh, and essentially just uh, I'm going to set up a base path, I'm going to set up a bronze path, a silver path, and a gold path, and then a checkpoint path. And I'll go over the checkpoint path in a minute with you. Um, and what these paths are going to, the, the, the files that we're going to store at these paths are essentially delta tables. And there are going to be delta tables at the various levels, at bronze, silver, and gold. Um, so anyway, um, let me go ahead and run that cell. And you notice it happened really quickly because all I did was just uh, set some paths. Now what we're going to do is we're going to save uh, some raw data into a bronze table. But first what we're going to do is we're going to create a schema. So what we have to do is we have to import some SQL types uh, using Python and, um, and then import some functions that we're going to need uh, from Python or uh, from, from some standard libraries anyway, from JSON and Unix timestamp. And then we're going to create a schema. So let's go ahead and run this cell. And you'll notice it, took, it didn't take very long at all because we're just assigning a schema to a variable. And then next, we're going to stream the data. We're going to actually stream some data into this bronze Databricks uh, Delta table. And um, we're going to stream it from a Kafka server. And the Kafka server is located at, it's, it's located at server1.databricks.training at port number 9092. And so uh, this is a, a, an example of streaming data uh into a uh, bronze table so let's go ahead and run this this um cell and get the stream started and we need to wait until the stream gets started before we do the, the other cells below so what we're doing here is we're just waiting on the stream to initialize and start uh working and um and what this code here represents is essentially we're loading data from this server, uh, streaming data, and we're loading it and we're creating a column, a JSON column, and we're taking it, uh, we're, we're essentially extracting the data from that column using from JSON, and we're extracting it into a string with, with the schema attached. And so what that does is it allows us to create a delta table that has a schema and you'll notice that it's reading the data in, the stream has started. So what we've done here is we've created a delta table based on a streaming source, and the delta table is, is um, being created and appended to, you'll notice the output mode is append, and so data is being appended to that table all, you know, over and over again as it comes in from the server. So, and run uh, this cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to create another high Metascore SQL table based on the Delta table. And, um, and essentially what we're going to do is, um, yeah, so we're going to create this Delta table. And uh, it's, it's essentially going to be a high Metascore table, sorry, uh, that's in our database. And I'll show you that uh, by going to data. And uh, we're gonna go to, um, I think it's this database here. Yeah, it's right here, Wikipedia edits raw. So uh, that's the table that was created um, and uh, right here. And um, 
we're, we're using the delta table uh, behind the scenes to create this SQL table. And so, uh, and, and basically we're bringing it from the bronze path. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at that raw data. So let's take a look at that. And um, we're gonna limit it to five records. And you'll see here that we've got um, a Kafka timestamp, a channel, a comment, and then a, a delta column and um, some other columns as well. Uh, Geocoding, uh, whether it's anonymous or not, whether it's a new page, whether it's a robot, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different columns here and the URL and all that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, that's the table that we've, that we've generated from our Delta table. Um, and then um, now we're gonna create a silver table by selecting certain columns from the bronze table. So we're gonna do a little bit of transformation here. And all that means is we're just gonna select a few columns from the bronze table and bring it into a silver table. So we're gonna write that to a silver table. So we're gonna run that cell. And again, it's streaming data, so we're, we've got to start a stream again. So we're using read stream, and that's all you have to do. Uh, if you do batch data, you're going to use read. If you do streaming data, you're going to use read stream. And that's the only difference between batch and streaming, really, with Delta. It's just that one statement. So if that's why it, it really unifies streaming and batch. Um, so anyway, we, we've got a checkpoint location. And the reason we have this checkpoint location is in case the streaming fails, we can restart the streaming at that checkpoint location and carry on. So that's why we have a checkpoint location. You'll notice that we're appending again. And so we're appending that data to the silver path. And, um, and so now we have a silver table, a silver delta table. So we're gonna create a SQL table from that silver delta table. So let's run that cell. And we're running the command now. And so now we've got a, a Wikipedia edits table. So I'll show you that table. And you'll see that it's right here, Wikipedia edits. And um, so anyway, um, so that's, that's our Wikipedia edits SQL table. And now what we're gonna do is take a peek at that data by looking at the silver table, uh, the silver SQL table, I should say. And it's updating the Delta table state right now. And then it's running the command. And um, so now, uh, okay, so here we go. So this is, the, this is the SQL table that we're reading from. And you'll notice that the data is displayed very nicely for us. And we could come in here and plot it if we wanted to. Uh, plot something, for instance. But um, right now, we're just going to look at the table itself. Um, and now, after we've done that, we've got a silver table. It looks good. So now we're going to create a gold delta table by reading the silver table path. So let's go ahead and do that. And you'll notice that we're, we're going to create a country code based on the geocoding uh, column. And uh, we're going to bring in namespace, country code is anonymous, and country, and uh, and we're going to group by country code. So and then do a count. So um, essentially, um, that's what our gold da data for, uh, delta table is going to look like. It's going to be an aggregated table that has some uh, data that we want to, to to store and show. So there we go. Uh, we've created the gold delta uh, the gold data frame based on a delta table. And now we're going to display this gold delta table data frame. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, it's a stream. So we've got to initialize another stream uh, to, to, in order to read this because it's all based on streaming data. So we've, we've got to initialize that. And, um, and we're doing that right now. So it's, it'll initialize here, and then we'll have uh, an actual table that will be displayed uh, as soon as it initializes. Um, so anyway, we'll wait here. <laughs> um, sometimes it takes a little bit. Again, this community edition is a, you know, it has a very uh, small cluster, so we don't get a lot of performance. But it's still a good place to come and try code out and and explore code and uh, 
you know, do do stuff like that. Uh, I wouldn't suggest it for anybody to 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 go and um, you know try to do any production workloads on it though. So we're still initializing the stream. Hopefully, it will come up and and get done here. Um, it's so it's it's going. Okay, we're we're good. So now we've got um, uh, the display query uh, um, uh, streaming action going on, and uh, this is the job data, uh, essentially the dashboard of the job data. And I just got that from just basically clicking this little arrow and looking at what's going on with the with the job data, and. Um, it's pretty interesting. You can do a lot of performance checks. I'm not going to worry about that here because, again, this server, uh, this cluster and workspace is, is not a production level workspace. So I'm not going to worry too much about performance. But I do want to show you the table. And here it is. It's got country code and then the total of, of uh, um, the total count and uh, for each country uh, of uh, Wikipedia pages. Um, and so um, that's our gold table. And that would be a table that we would then do further analysis on, for instance, or, or um, send it to our data scientist and have him work with it or something like that. In this case, it's a very simple gold table. I'll, get, I'll grant you that. But it is a gold table, and it has the data that we want in a, in a very clean state. So anyway, that's pretty much it for this demo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run a cell here to stop all the streams. And, uh, and then I'm going to remove a directory as well to get rid of all the data. Um, so I'm running the cell right now. And what that does is it just loops through all the active streams and it stops them. Um, oh, it looks like I ran into an error. Uh, for some reason, I'm getting a timeout exception on one of the streams. So I'll just go up and cancel the stream manually then. Um, yeah, it's right here. So I'm just going to cancel this and click yes. And then I'm going to go up and see if there's any other streams that are running. There is. So I'm going to cancel that one. Yes. And then uh, I think that's the only streams I had. Yeah, there's just three. Um, so anyway, I'm canceling all those streams, and it looks like they canceled. So anyway, that's the end of this demo. So let's go back to the slide deck, and uh, real quick, and wrap up, uh, wrap this up. So that was the demo. Um, for resources, um, what I would recommend for people to do if you want to learn Databricks is go out to academy.databricks.com and uh, go to their self-paced web uh, page. And you can go out there and look at all the courses that are available, and there's a ton of them. And what they end up being is, they, they, what they do is they prepare these courses as, as Jupyter Notebooks. And then you can uh, import those notebooks into something like uh, Community Edition Databricks, and then do all your training on the Community Edition of Databricks. And uh, that's what I did when I was learning. And um, basically, uh, it's really nice. You're, you're, I think the courses are like $75 a piece. And if you're a partner, it's free. Uh, we're a partner, so all the courses are free for us. But if you're not, I think they're only $75. And then finally, there's a reference for Delta, uh, all about Delta. And that's located at docs.delta.io. So anyway, that's pretty much it. I'm ready to take questions now. Um, and uh, I'll just open this up and see what kind of questions I have. Um, let's see. Um, questions. Here we are. Um, OK, I've got a question. Why the name change away from Pragmatic Works? OK, uh, so what's going on is uh, Pragmatic Works was purchased by a company called Three Cloud. And uh, that's just, it's happening right now as we speak. And uh, Kevin, and um, it's, it's essentially uh, Pragmatic Works is, is, is being uh, um, purchased by Three Cloud. And we'll go under the Three Cloud name uh, soon. Uh, there's some um, 
work that we have to do to merge everything and all our operational systems, but soon we'll go by the name of three cloud. So that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing there. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, looks like we've got, hold on a minute. Oh gosh, yeah, we've got a lot of questions. Okay, um, let me expand this um, so I can see the questions. Um, wow, okay, let me see how do I, how do I expand these? Um, Alex Flores, um, that's not a question, it just says yes. Okay, um, I missed your mention of three cloud. I missed your mention of three cloud. I was getting into the meeting. Can you explain more, something about emails? How is three cloud related to pragmatic works? Okay. Once again, uh, Three Cloud has purchased Pragmatic Works, so um, we are we are going to be under the Three Cloud umbrella soon, um, and and that's going to be taking place uh, as we speak, pretty much. Um, there's another question here um, by an, by a a guy named Van Dyke, and um, Okay, that's, that's again, it's just about free cloud and everything. So um, I think I've answered that fairly well. Uh, thumbs up, I can hear you. Kevin Wolf can hear both, Todd Gain. Okay, why the name change away from Pragmatic Works? After the data is gold ready, do you feel that, do you feed that into the data lake for user consumption? Yes, um, so this question was, uh, after the data is gold ready, do you feed that into the data lake for user consumption? And the answer to that question is definitely yes. So um, you can do two things here. You can go ahead and store it as a gold table, a gold delta table in um, your data lake uh, and you know set permissions on it and all that sort of thing. And then uh, essentially point your users to that, to that table and then they can read it into their systems or their tools of choice. And uh, data scientists can go in and, and do data science work. Uh, BI folks can do BI work. Analysts can do analyst work, you know, the whole nine yards. And then you can also do what we showed you in the demo, and that is, is create a SQL table that is bound to the cluster or to the workspace. And once, if the cluster is running, you can actually go out and query that table um, just like you would any other table using a connection, a connection string. And I know with Power BI, for instance, you can go in and, and, and query your data, um, your, your SQL data using uh, Power BI. But um, anyway, yeah, so you definitely would put that in your data lake. Um, let's see, I've got another question here. Um, Sorry, I believe that question was asked by Justin Rister. So Justin, I hope that answers your question. What is actually a data lake house? Uh, this was asked by somebody uh, named RS. So what a data lake house is, essentially it's, a co it's kind of a combination of a data warehouse and a data lake. And the con it's a concept really. And um, what Delta Lake does is it makes these kinds of concepts a reality because it brings in acid transactions, it brings in all these other features, and it allows you to, to really uh, uh, transact your data like you would be transacting it in a SQL or a relational data store. And so um, it really brings a lot of reliability and power and um, uh, um, uh, you know, accuracy to your, to your data in a data lake. And so that's really kind of what a data lake house refers to is it, it, it's really just kind of a concept. Um, let's see here. Or is the data lake feeding the raw data into Apache? Um, what is actually a data lake? Okay, I'm sorry, bear with me. It's kind of hard to read these questions because 
they are not shown uh, very well here on the screen. Um, Justin has another question. Or is the data lake feeding the raw data into Apache? Uh, okay, so I think maybe what they're asking here is, you know, how, how do we get the RONS data? And the RONS data is really just our first initial read of data from the data lake into a delta table. And you'll notice that we, we attached uh, a, a schema to that data and, um, and, and then we read it in and and if it didn't meet that schema if it didn't match that schema then it would error out and we wouldn't be able to read it in so we would know that our data was was uh at least matched the schema so it allows you to 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 um feed the data into the bronze table with a schema attached and then going forward you know you can trust that data to match that schema so that's kind of what that's all about um, how do you schedule or automate the code in Databricks Notebook? Okay, so this is pretty easy to do. Um, what you can do is um, you can go to your job and create a job. So I'm, I'm going back over to the, to the cluster here. And uh, the, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to create a job on this community edition because it, it doesn't allow you to create jobs. But what you would do is you would create a job and attach your notebook to that job. And uh, then you would schedule the job to run. And so that's how you would, you would automate your notebook. So um, let's see what, or let's see, are we, uh, are we saying with Data Lakehouse coming in, the traditional SQL data warehouse are going away? That's a very good question. Um, I, you know, some people maintain that, uh, some people believe that. Other people, including myself, don't believe that at all. I think what you're going to see is you're still going to see a data warehouse, like a SQL data warehouse, um, being used by people, but it's going to be in conjunction with a data lake. And because um, there's just so much power with being able to store so much data on a data lake and uh, be able to just pick and choose what you're going to read into your data warehouse from there, and um, it, it's just it, the the two together are are phenomenal. I mean, they allow you to to really analyze your data, all of your data, uh, in one fell swoop. So no, I don't. I personally don't think uh, data warehouses are going to go away anytime soon. Uh, they very well some some people may decide not to use a data warehouse and just rely on Delta Lake. And uh, in fact, the project that I'm working on now, um, what we're doing is we're, we're preparing the data into gold tables, and then we're, we're sending those gold tables to a SQL server to be part of an application. So if they're, not, if they're not being fed into the data warehouse, they're actually being fed into an application database. So uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, it, it, it's gonna really depend on the person or the team or the company as to what they do there. Uh, can you explain the features of the metadata abilities of the delta tables? So that's essentially the, the features are that you can go in and um, uh, essentially uh, work with the metadata uh, just like you would the, the real data. So you can go in and query the metadata. You can use the describe detail feature that I showed you. Um, to, to read all the metadata of the table. Now, I didn't have a lot of metadata uh, to show you, but describe detail is definitely the way to get at that metadata. So uh, thank you, Christine, for that question. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm just unclear where the data lake comes in. Uh, okay, so where the data lake comes in is, is we need a place to store our data, right? So we have petabytes and petabytes of data out there. And um, we need a place to dump that data and, and store it securely, right? So a data lake is really, is really a, a good spot for that kind of stuff because we can use POSIX, uh, ACLs, we can secure the data, um, and, and then we can start reasoning about the data and storing it in certain paths and stuff like that. 
and then use something like Delta Lake to make sense of the data and do ETL and all that sort of thing. So yes, a data lake is very important for storing data long term, and it's a very cost effective way to store that amount of data long term. Um, you compare that to a SQL data warehouse and the costs are, are tremendously different. I mean, storing data in a data lake is very cheap compared to running a SQL data warehouse. So that's, that's one of the reasons to use a data lake. Um, so all this says is before or after ETL. So I can't really understand that question. Um, maybe that was part of this other question. I don't know. Um, uh, here's a question. We have plans to migrate Informatica Teradata DW to ADLS Gen 2 Databricks. Um, okay. So how efficient would this be? And is it being done now? Yes, it is being done now. Uh, and um, people are doing it all over the world. And um, it's, it's a very efficient way to do it, actually, because what you do is you essentially just take your data from Teradata and, um, and store that data on a data lake, and then you start reading the data in using Delta Lake. And, um, and you create all your bronze, silver, and gold tables in, in, in your data lake, and then you've essentially converted all that data uh, from your Teradata database to um, Databricks and Delta Delta tables. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people are doing it and and finding that it's very cost effective and um, and very easy to do. Uh, so how efficient would this be, and is it being done now? Okay, I've already asked answer that question. Um, let's see. All right, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much for everyone. Um, I think that's all the questions. Um, I appreciate everyone uh, uh, attending, and um, I am sorry about the hiccup with the slide deck. I'm not a PowerPoint expert, and uh, it looks like I had a problem getting out of sequence because I had hidden some slides, and so I'm, I do apologize for that. But um, I hope you've learned something today. I hope you didn't waste your time at all. And um, I really appreciate you attending. And um, you can reach me at vcuster at threecloudsolutions.com for any other questions or comments. And I'll be happy to take them. So have a good day. And once again, thanks a lot for attending. Thank you, Brian. We want to thank you so much for hosting. And like Brian said, um, this video will be up on Pragmatic Works YouTube channel. We will be um, giving out some uh emails about us switching over over to three clouds youtube channel but the recording will be up on the pragmatic words youtube channel you guys will receive an email link tomorrow in your email box so stay tuned for that and if you guys have any questions like brian said please feel free to reach out to him or myself we'll be more than happy to help i want to thank you guys again so much for giving us um, a nice hour of your tuesday i hope you guys have a good rest of your day thank you ryan thank you